The WaveSofa 3000 is a new entry-level oscilloscope from LeCroy. And uh, first thing right off the bat, what I like about it is uh, compared to other entry-level oscilloscopes from LeCroy, like the uh, WaveAce for instance, is that it comes with a real Teledyne LeCroy look and feel. The scope looks a lot like other LeCroy scopes. It operates in a similar fashion. So if you're used to uh, more expensive LeCroy variants, uh, you can definitely operate the scope right out of the box without having to read up the manual. And the other way around, if you uh, learn on this oscilloscope, you're going to be able to operate most uh, upper level Teledyne LeCroy scopes right out of the box. And the user interface is uh, something that LeCroy has always been pretty good in. If you look at the HDO 4000 that I've been using throughout the blog and several places, um, it has a very nice menu. It's a, it's a touch screen menu structure. It's a very intuitive menu structure. And this is really LeCroy's selling point of the WaveSurfer 3000. It comes with a 10.1 inch uh, TFT. You see this here, it is touch screen and uh, it has a bunch of very nice functions we're gonna have a closer look at. But before, before we get into this, let's have a look at the box and see what comes with the scope. So this little box here contains all the accessories and documents that you need for the scope. Up here, and this is typical for LeCroy, glued in an envelope with the calibration documents. Right here, a little overview of what's supposed to be in the box. Declaration of conformity. And I really like when manufacturers actually print this sort of stuff. You know, often you nowadays just find uh, that kind of uh, documents on a CD or for download on the website. And I really appreciate it when the manufacturers actually include it. You have two packs of the uh, PP020 uh, probes. This is a four channel oscilloscope. So you're getting uh, two packs with uh, two probes each. And uh, the probes contain a bunch of accessories. You see the color coding rings, different tips, and lots of spare parts in case you break something. This is uh, very LeCroy typical, very good. Um, the oscilloscope does come with an SD card. It's a micro SD card. It's already installed in the oscilloscope. And if you read here, it actually says that right here, micro SD card installed. And uh, to be able to read it with your average computer, LeCroy actually includes this uh, little micro SD to SD adapter. Uh, it's Kingston brand, so they didn't try to cut any money there. So that's the box, that's what comes with it. So as far as the controls are concerned, you can access just about anything in the scope via the touch screen. Like uh, you have your vertical setup here, the channel setups, you have your time base setup right here, math and measure functions up here. But at the same time, most important functions such as your channel menus, like here for channel one. Nope, now I disable channel one. If I click on it again and hit this uh, channel one menu here, the menu comes out as well. So uh, there are several ways to get to it. You have your channel controls for whatever channel is active. In this case, it's one. You can see it by the light on here. Uh, you have your vertical and horizontal set up there. So uh, if you feel more comfortable pushing buttons, you can. And you have quick access buttons here for certain functions like your trigger setup, trigger mode, and uh, just really important stuff that you wanna have handy with a one click uh, option. Uh, but again, you can access everything over the uh, touch screen. Now, one of the first interjections that many people have to touch screen oscilloscopes is that you can't stick your fingers on the display and point at stuff. You know, you just want to point out something, all of a sudden you did something like there. Uh, I just added a zoom trace inadvertently. Of course, I did that on intention, but maybe I just wanted to point something out and didn't want to screw up my settings. Well, that's not really a problem. You got a touch screen button up here, and now there's absolutely nothing you can do uh, to screw up your, your measurement setup. So that was really thoughtful. Let's disable that zoom trace again. Boom, it's gone. All right, now this is the 500 megahertz version. There are 200 megahertz, 350 megahertz, and 500 megahertz versions. They all have four giga samples per second. And uh, that's pretty impressive, uh, it's especially for the price class. Uh, the WaveSurfer 3000 series starts right around uh, $3,000. So again, this is something that's reasonably affordable for hobbyists with uh, some requirements for higher class equipment, most definitely. Um, 
It has a bunch of interesting functions like uh, LeCroy's history mode, wave scan, and decode mode. Those are typical LeCroy things that you find in, I think, all upper class LeCroy oscilloscopes. And uh, we're gonna have a look at how those work and what they do for you momentarily. This is a four channel version. It also has 16 digital channels. So it is a mixed, uh, mixed signal oscilloscope or an oscilloscope with mixed signal capability. It also has a wave source signal generator integrated in the oscilloscope. The output for that uh, frequency generator or, or function generator is on the backside of the oscilloscope. Now, if you hit this button, you see you got sine, square, triangle, pulse available. You have a DC voltage available, noise, and uh, a bunch of demos. Now what's really nice is that they have a DC option in there. Most function generators don't. Why would they, right? I mean, a function generator is supposed to generate a function. But isn't it nice to have a voltage source available from your scope? All you have to do is clamp your device. You may, be, may want a power or bias. Uh, up to the scope on the back, you know, just connect a couple of banana leads through a proper adapter, of course, onto the BNC and off you go. I think that's a really nice idea. The uh, maximum frequency is 25 megahertz, but I think that's actually dependent on the kind of function you're generating. But for sine, it's going to be 25 megahertz. What you're seeing on the display is a UART signal that I'm just feeding in here via channel one from this WaveSource 100. The WaveSource 100 is a simple demonstration board that Lee Croy uses to demonstrate certain features of the oscilloscopes. It's very handy just to uh, illustrate real quick what all the functions do. Uh, this here is a UART signal it's supposed to have a uh, data rate of 100 kilobits per second and it's perfect uh, to demonstrate the uh, decode function that the scope comes with. So right now we got everything set up. We're seeing the signal. If we hit the decode button on decode one, we can select the protocol that we want. You see there's uh, several different type of protocols available. Uh, most important ones are definitely going to be RS-232, UART, SPI, I2C. So uh, we want UART here and uh, our data is coming from channel one. If you have some protocols like SPI that need uh, multiple lines, uh, you can assign them freely. Uh, it even considers chip select, which many oscilloscopes don't. Anyway, so what we want to do is we want to switch this on, of course. What we also want to do is we want to link this to the trigger. You see those jumps there? Right now we're still triggering off an edge. Now we're actually triggering off a, uh, a UART event and apparently it's still not entirely happy there. But uh, let's ignore that for now. Here in the deco setup, we can set our parameters. And it's actually very forgiving. Like, let's look at the data rate. Of course, I set this up previously, but let's say I put it to 80K. It tells you it's a framing error. And uh, sometimes it doesn't correct. It doesn't correctly uh, recognize the speed. But if you're close, like here, now I put in 90 kilobits per second, it knows we're off. It shows the factual speed here. But of course, this causes problems. But uh, it's relatively forgiving. So you don't have to actually put... 100% accurate uh, speed in there. Uh, you have several display modes. Right now we have the ASCII view mode and uh, if we uh, zoom in a little bit, make it easier to read. You read it's uh, Lee Croy UART. It's the readout to it. And uh, let's see if we can get this stabilized somehow. All right, let's not worry about that right now. Decode function, let's go back here into the decode setup. You can set it to hex, you can view it in binary, and you can view, of course, decimal. Uh, so uh, if you want something in plain text, you're going to put it to ASCII most of the time. Of course, you can send your data bits, parity, stop bits, all that good stuff. Uh, polarity, I had to change that from idle low to idle high, and uh, that's doing the trick. All right, that's the serial decode function, and it does a large range of, of different protocols. You've seen that in a previous setting. It can decode multiple protocols at the same time, as you've seen here in the serial decode. I'm not sure if it does that on the same channel. Let's see what it does if I tell it to. Apparently, it allows me to do that. Now, of course, this would be silly, but I can do different decodes at the same time on different buses if I absolutely wanted to. Now, that's really nice. Okay, now let's uh, turn it off and move on to the next function. Okay, the next interesting function is the history mode. 
If you hit the history button right here, the oscilloscope is going to store multiple acquisition in its memory. And you can just go through here and uh, look at all the different acquisitions and uh, have a higher likelihood of detecting an, an anomaly that you would have otherwise not seen. This is a very, very useful, quite obviously, uh, especially with oscilloscopes with a very fast waveform update rate like this one. Sometimes just uh, it doesn't catch your eye. I mean, of course, that's what you have persistency settings for and that sort of stuff. But it's a whole lot more convenient to be able to scroll through different things, especially if you have non-monotonic signals. Uh, it's really easy not to capture it with your eyes and, and just have something slip through. The next feature that I'd like to show is called WaveScan. WaveScan basically automatically detects anomalies for you so that you don't have to. That's very nice, especially for automated uh, testing and uh, that sort of stuff. Um, I don't really want to say that it's useful for automation, but it's definitely helpful to uh, do lots of work so that you don't have to scroll through pages and pages of history or something like that. It, it can just uh, simply show you anomalies. And uh, you see the signal here has extreme jitter. If I do single acquisition, there's one waveform. If I do it again, you see our distance here between the pulses varies. And uh, there may be something else hidden in it. And uh, let's throw some measurement functions on here just because. Let's go into the measurement setup. Let's measure the rise time. Enable the table. And uh, that's cool. Now we see a rise time and we see it varies. So uh, just to get a little bit uh, of a clearer picture here, let's put the statistics on. And to visualize this, put histonics on. Well, let's wait for a little bit. So the signal is running through there. It's doing this thing. And uh, we're starting to see a couple of things like my mean is around 43 nanoseconds right now and the current value kind of fluctuates around that too and every once in a while you see a high value pop up i can see this here the max value claims to be 123 nanoseconds something is just not right there so apparently we're having a good average around 40 something nanoseconds and and something is peaking in there around 123 nanoseconds that's not good something is not right so we want to detect that. We want to isolate this event. Of course, we can try now with single captures to see if there's anything wrong, but I don't see anything. The rise time looks perfectly normal. It looks, looks the same on all of those signals, doesn't it? So let's have a look. Let's see what uh, WaveScan can do. Just hit the WaveScan button, click Enable, and our condition, and I already had this set up previously, is going to be that our rise time is bigger than 100 nanoseconds. Oh. Stop acquisition is set. All right, so let's make this a little bit smaller here. Let's give it more acquisitions. All right, now it says wave scan stopped acquisition while I was messing with this because an event was found and I didn't zoom in correctly. You can see apparently there's something broken with this edge, but we didn't see this capture well because I was messing with the inputs while WaveScan was doing its thing. So let's just hit it on normal again. And you know, those edges are all okay. WaveScan is doing its thing. It's looking for edges that are higher than 100 nanoseconds, which is the limit we set it to. And let's wait a moment, see what happens. Boom, there it is. Now WaveScan found an edge that is having a rise time of smaller than 100 nano, larger than 100 nanoseconds. And quite obviously, something is not right there. This is not a clean edge. Something is going on. So if this were a real circuit, we would have to do some troubleshooting. But this is a great example of something that would be really, really tough to capture if you would have to scroll through the history or, or just try to glance at it on the display. You know, if, if you would have been in this mode here without a zoom fa function and this automatic search function, you would have probably missed it. The odds are very high that you would have missed it and your circuit is doing something that you just can't explain. If this would be a clock up here, aside from the fact that it has extreme jitter, probably your circuit would have done something funky here. Read the wrong data or read it at the wrong time during a transition, something like this. This could have been a real headache, but the function just finds it for you. Now, 
I jumped ahead really I wanted to go here and uh, didn't really show you the setup I apologize for going through that way too quick so let's go there again I hit enable obviously wanted to enable it and our mode we can do edge detection non monotonic stuff we can detect runs measurements and bus pattern we wanted to do a specific measurement our source is C1 the filter method you have a bunch of uh, things like less than you have within limits delta you have uh, of course greater than smaller than all that good stuff no filter outside limit inside limit that sort of stuff and we chose greater than we knew that there was apparently something going on that gives us an edge that's higher than 100 nanoseconds so that's the number I typed in just hit this field type in 100 and make sure that you don't just hit OK make sure that you actually tell the scope what unit it is it's nanoseconds so hit N and it takes that as automatic enter as well and just closes the screen and that's all you have to do it's really easy it's straightforward you can do this with uh, plenty of measurement functions and uh, let's see if we uh, that's not what I wanted to do let's see measure setup I wanted to here we go reset this and uh, if you now let it run look at the histonics you can see that after a while now that's starting to build you can see that we're having our normal edges here and you're having a different edge here you see that this kind of bimodal distribution and that's a great example of uh, why those histonics are useful and why those uh, averaging functions here are nice the statistics functions it tells you so much without having to think of course you can sit down and, and write the numbers down and try to catch all this but it's just it's a big headache obviously and uh, again WaveScan found our other edge there but if we continue the acquisition it tells you a lot I mean we would have probably not even known that there's an a price time problem if we wouldn't have seen this I mean this was this was our lead for troubleshooting this particular problem all right, that's it. That was just a quick intro and overview of the functions of the WaveSurfer 3000. I apologize in advance for the uh, horrible glare over the display, but uh, both this display and the HDO 4000 display are just horrible to capture because they are so reflective that my lights that I'm using here always give some sort of glare. I try to position them as well as I can, but you see it's kind of like a mirror. See, uh, I can wave at you through it and uh, anyway I tried the best I can let's see what we can do in post to fix it all right now you've seen uh, out of the box demo a couple of, uh, of, of examples of what what the scope can do for you how it can help you troubleshoot a certain issue and uh, uh, that's it if you have any questions about the scope in particular or if you have any ideas of what I should show with it or um, any questions about particular applications problems and uh, questions whether or not the scope can help you let me know post it down in the comment section if you like the video give it a big thumbs up and uh, share it with your friends see you next time